kind of bringing in the triplicity to me is a really, really important concept because I'm personally comforted by the idea of cycles beginning and ending and giving us opportunities to like try again. Welcome to Soror Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hello and welcome everyone. Marianne and I are here today to talk about the symbol of triplicity. And before we get started with our new episode, we like to tell each other what we're reading because we love to read and love to learn. So mm-hmm. Marianne, what are you reading? I am reading good things. I am reading, um, I just started the other day, Illumina- The Illuminations of Hildegard von Bingen. I am a huge Hildegard fan. You are too. Um, So I bought, it's edited by Matthew Fox with a lot Mm -hmm. of commentary. Um, And it's, it's just very delightful. So I'm reading about all the weird, crazy things that Hildegard prophesied um, that are all amazing. Do you know that she like scolded like popes all the time? I do. (laughs) She'd write them letters and be like, you're not holy enough. (laughs) Shame on you. Um, But I love Hildegard because her, um, her faith, she's a Christian nun, and um, her faith is very nature-based and slightly erotic. Um, so right up my alley. Um, I'm getting weird already. We've already been That's here. such a silly pun. <laughs> One minute. Right up your alley. Here we are. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> we have the sillies today for triplicity time. <laughs> We're just tired. Um, and I'm also re- I also just started a um, new fiction book called um, The Snow Child which I just, I also found in the little book cabinet, little library thing. Um, <laughs> you, had, you had a name for it. What is it actually yeah, called? It's out here. A free out here, library. It's called the Little Free Library. And people have a library. little sign. And actually in Oregon, people will decorate theirs with like moss and like little fake oh. birds. It's, it's wow. really, yeah. So it's not just the outside book cabinet. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's really supposed to be called. Anyway, I picked it up from that. Um, so what are you reading? <laughs> Um, I'm still working on my references book, which is the book that I've been reading for the past three weeks. How dare I? But it's like it's really juicy. It's yeah, it's really rich and um, it's it's pretty academic at this point. So this um, scholar is like going through these interesting uh, charts of um, different buildings in Renaissance Italy that were like elected to be consecrated at particular times. And it's going to start looking at paintings and sculpture and stuff like that. So the idea of like cosmic rays uh, impacting buildings and artworks in Renaissance Italy was a huge deal. Um, And even like cities would be, I learned this, cities would be re-consecrated or re-founded, um, you know, after a period of a few hundred years because new leaders would decide that the chart of the original founding was not good enough and was not oh, wow. imbuing the city with good energy. I know it's so interesting. Um, and so we use that a lot in astrological magic for talisman creation. And essentially it's just saying that Italian Renaissance art a lot of it were astrological talismans, which is really fascinating if you think about how in the world that we live in, we just kind of avoid or deny the relevance or the historical um, importance of astrology, but it's literally woven into the fabric of, you know, Renaissance Italy it was like such a an important cultural, you know, place uh, for so much of what we still do now. So I find that very interesting, but it is a little dry, so I'm going slow. I know. Um, you have to go slow with those. <laughs> like I I have, I give myself permission to do 10 pages a day when I hit mm-hmm. one of those books where it's like, this is really interesting, but also, holy cow. <laughs> Honestly, the 10 pages a day rule is such a good idea because if you set that small goal – and just do that consistently, mm-hmm. you will absolutely read way more than if you were just mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm going to read, you know, today and put pressure on yourself to read all the time. Like 10 pages is amazing, I think, daily. Yeah. The other book I'm reading is um, 
a book of collected lectures uh, by Melanie Reinhardt, who is an astrologer, and it's called Saturn, Chiron, and the Centaurs. And it's about um, the centaur asteroids in astrology. And I'm um, definitely having like a centaur phase, but I'm also teaching my Chiron mm-hmm. class, which I taught last year. I'm holding it again, and I guess I can announce this here on uh, March 14th. Um, Mm -hmm. We'll start. This class is called The Healer Within Chiron in Astrology and Myth. And um, Chiron, for anyone who doesn't know, is an asteroid in astrology that symbolizes our own kind of inner wounding and what we need in order to find deep integration. And so it's a really psychic point. It's a really emotional point. It has a lot to do with the inner child, early life experience, and our own healing gifts. And just in this month coming up, and really through early April, there are so many significant planetary conjunctions with Chiron. So I looked ahead at the ephemeris and I was like, damn, Chiron's talking to us. So I'm Mm going to offer this class again. So it's three parts and it's, um, you know, just three, three pretty lectures um, and some hopefully really enticing food for thought about Mm -hmm. connecting with your own Chiron. So if you're interested in that, that's all linked on my website and I'd love to have you in class if you're a listener Mm -hmm. here. That one was one of my favorites that you've done. Yeah, I really loved it. It was like very, very deep, very reflective, very poetical. Thanks. So um, highly recommend it. Definitely do it. Thank you. So um, here are are some triplicities that we can consider or that exist already. So there are three graces, three fates, three tones in a musical chord, but we'll Mm -hmm. get more into music later. Mm -hmm. Um, There are three phases of the lunar cycle. Um, Mariana, what are the three? There's three witches in Hocus Pocus. And in Macbeth. There are three witches in Macbeth. I was just, I was just thinking about Macbeth the other day for no reason. Um, (laughs) I saw the, the Denzel Washington um, Macbeth and it was actually pretty good. Frances McDormand too, which is amazing. Yeah, she's Um, awesome. Cool. mm Mm-hmm. I think there's three witches also in, um, have you ever read or seen Stardust? Mm-mm. There's a lot of three witches. People really like to to make three witches. Yeah. There are three wishes that we get when we find a genie in a bottle. Uh-huh. There are nine muses, which reduce down to three. Uh-huh. Um, and there is obviously the triple goddess that is everywhere in all things. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to open up with a quote to reflect on yes. just to, to get us started, right? Because triplicity as a concept is one of those things that is um, immersed in so many different cultures, so many different art forms, so many different religions and spiritual approaches. And so it's like, how do you even decide where you're going to begin with the triplicity idea? So I'm going to start with a quote from Demetra George, who is an astrologer and um someone who has done a lot of work on the goddess uh, Mandala, actually. So uh, that, that's interesting. She doesn't keep it tied to the three. She expands it to the four. Now we can explore that. Um, but let's open up with this quote on the triple goddess. Um, so this comes from Demetra George's book called Asteroid Goddesses, the Mythology, Psychology, and Astrology of the Reemerging Feminine. And she's talking about the... Um, triplicity of the moon goddess, which I think is one of the triplicities that we're all most familiar with. So we'll start here. Mm -hmm. Um, So she writes that the moon goddess became refined and revered in a symbology known as the triple moon goddess, venerated for much of human history. In her phase of waxing, she is Artemis, the first virginal budding, who rules the season of spring. In the full moon, she is Selene, the woman or mother associated with fertility and productivity. And in her waning crescent shape, she is Hecate, who symbolizes the distillation of wisdom and the dissemination of life into death. From here, she reemerges as the maiden and the cycle begins again. The concept of the goddess in triplicate is laced throughout mythology and the cultural imagination where the feminine is concerned. Um, There are three fates, three graces, and the Greeks recognize three seasons. And so thinking about this triplicate lunar formation, um, again, it's familiar. We all see the moon all the time. Moon language is pretty popular in um, occult circles and communities Mm -hmm. that we're part of. So, yeah, I thought that would be an interesting place to just kind of jump off from. 
Yeah, it's so gorgeous. I think we can't we can't start a conversation about triplicity about triplicities. That's going to be a tough word to say. Over and over <laughs> like, again. <laughs> through the length of this. Um, well, what we what we mean when we say triplicity is tripleness, like the the idea of the three in its in this formation. So we can't talk about it without starting with the triple goddess because it is so prominent in our spirituality today, in our reclamation of feminine spirituality. Um, so I think it's it's just it's such a a fascinating idea that um, we see this ancient pattern of the goddess in maidenhood, motherhood, and then I guess cronehood. We can just make up that word. Mm-hmm. Um, in this this like idea of of birth and development, then authority, sovereignty, mastery, this is kind of like that mother phase and fertility too. And then, you know, this, this space of deep wisdom and this kind of moving out into the cosmic sphere. A couple years ago, I, um, I had the, the real privilege of working with this composer, Gary Shaw, who passed away this past fall. So I've, I've been thinking about him and uh, our music um, a lot. So I was his, I, I performed his music. I sang it. And I was also his lyricist. Um, and so he, he wrote this, this piece that he called timeless. Um, and he was kind of like, well, you know, and it was in three parts, three movements. And he was like, what is this for you? Like, what does this feel like for you? And I, I listened to it and it, it really felt like that, that kind of progression of um of that triple goddess energy and so i i kind of did this interesting thing where in that first movement associated with the maiden i used the the uh i um i used the first person and then in the second movement i used you the second person and then that final movement i used the third person um and i felt like that was a really interesting thing that just kind of came up for me just intuitively as I was writing that this development of that triple goddess mirrors this development within ourselves of, you know, self-agency, self-discovery, who are we, the I-ness, then this sense of being in relationship with the world and others, you-ness, and then finally this, this cosmic collective vision that feels like that crone energy of like allness, um, and so that was, I don't know, that's just kind of what I was thinking about as we were thinking about the, the triple goddess. That's so cool. And such a beautiful, small piece of your work with him. And yeah. I know that you've been thinking a lot about him this week. So um, thank you for sharing that with all of us. Yeah. And we should also um, try to listen to that piece. That I can really link cool. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean... It's wild, so <laughs> yeah, he was kind of an experimental, right? Uh, musician. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. His music was um, styled after um, Steve Reich, who's yeah. like a very experimental modernist uh, composer. So it's totally atonal, and I I figured out how to do things with my voice that I did not know were humanly possible. That's so, <laughs> so cool. You know, like a, when the cats like see little birds in the window, they're like. Ah! I do have yeah. that little, yeah. I, I had to figure out how to sing that on like uh, a high F, and so that was um, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's it was amazing. very, it was actually very cool. I, I, uh, <laughs> it was wild. So I'll see if I can, if I can link it and then yeah. people can go listen to it, but don't ex- have, have, don't expect anything. <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't, we won't. just don't know what to expect, and then you'll <laughs> enjoy it because <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But I loved it. Oh my god, I loved it so much. That sounds so cool. And I think that the, um, the way that, you know, you're bringing in language for the, um, you know, for second and third person, it's like, you know, we are very much in that sort of like ego centered, like freshness in the maiden stage. And Mm -hmm. then I am not a mom, but I would imagine that becoming a mother or aging into that, you know, role, like you do have to kind of be so aware of the other or the we, um, as a, yeah. a way of like survival and then the wisdom of 
you know, the crone and what she's disseminating Mm -hmm. then shifts that perspective further. So, yeah, yeah. I liked uh, in that one that it felt, it felt very cool to kind of think about like, how would she narrate her own story in the third Mm -hmm. person? I feel like that's, that, that is kind of the mark of wisdom is that we can watch ourselves to an extent and, and not be so lost in, in the self-identity, in the ego, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, anyway, we're skipping ahead to (laughs) a little bit and, and getting into that that psychological realm I want to stick with um with like this this idea of that the triple goddess for a second we will get yeah. there though <laughs> I'm gonna bring in some some good juicy Jungian thoughts um but yeah one of the things that I know that you you brought up is how often the three and this is you know part of that quote too is how often the three appears especially in Greek mythology and i i kind of wonder what you make of that because Mm. it's so it's so interesting like even the seasons yeah the threeness is interesting because it just is so pervasive so i think that it like the short answer to that question is that it just gets back to the idea that the goddess is at the bottom of everything and Mm. that's really really central to culture at this point in time um but you know, there are like the different versions of that three goddess formation um, yeah. are kind of endless. And I love the kind of severity and creepiness of like the Moirai, the three fates mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. like spin our thread of life and then snip it when it's time for us to die. And then on the other hand, there are three graces who are like beauty and sweetness and mm-hmm. um even the nine muses right nine yeah. is a multiple of three and mm-hmm. you know i think that originally there was like one muse and then there was there were three and then there were nine because the arts expanded or because some kind of there's just some sort of connection there with the expansion of what the muses were responsible for but it's all rooted in there and i do think that it all just goes back again to the centrality of um lunar consciousness and the centrality of the feminine life cycle, which is literally life creating, life giving. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing against sperm. We need sperms. <laughs> <ever. laughs> nothing against sperm. <laughs> we <laughs> put that in the in the video for Instagram. But the you know, we're doing it. We're making milk and oh, we do it, yes. Skin it. and bones and it's freaking cool. So you know, I think that the awesomeness and the, again, the scariness of like birth and death being held in the same body um, is really stunning to the early imagination. Um, and maybe I'm projecting, but I would assume Mm-mm. that that's kind of where that is rooted. So yeah, absolutely. I think that where where we can maybe move this conversation, I have a, I have a good quote by Gerard Adler, um, in which he says, who was, by the way, a, a, a very prominent depth psychologist. And he says, the feminine triad is always connected with instinctual events in their natural development and growth, whereas the masculine three is based on the dynamic opposition between thesis and antithesis, finding its reconciliation in the third step of the synthesis. And I just think that this is such an interesting quote because when we are talking about what the three represents, Um, We, of course, our minds go to the triple goddess today in 2023 um, in this modern spiritual landscape. But if this podcast were happening 50 years ago, that's not what we would think of. We would be thinking of the Trinity, of the Christian Trinity, because that was the main symbol of divinity, um, of spirituality uh, for thousands of years. Um, And so I really like how Adler kind of breaks this down and, and says, well, the three is an archetype that connects very powerfully to both the masculine and the feminine. And of course, whenever we're talking about masculine and feminine, we're always talking about archetypal experiences, right? So I think everybody participates in both of these sides of, of this, of that triplicity. Um, So this idea that the feminine is connected to the natural development, this instinctual cycle of threeness where the masculine side is in this, Hegelian dialectic. So we can like just if if you've ever taken a philosophy class, <laughs> you've probably heard of the Hegelian dialectic. Um, and if you haven't, very basically what it is 
is that uh, we have Hegel theorized that in, in like developing ideas, we have a thesis, an idea, then we have an antithesis, the opposite of that idea or a contrary idea. And through holding those two things, we'll eventually arrive at a synthesis, at a, a third way, uh, some kind of a combination or a middle way through those ideas to, to actually create something viable. Um, and so that's this masculine orientation to, to the Trinity. Um, and that's even something that Jung uh, kind of mentioned at some point. He, he kind of pointed to the father and the son as being this thesis and antithesis an antithesis doesn't actually have to mean opposite or bad or negation. It just means like a, a different, a different way, like an, uh, another kind of viewpoint. Um, and so through that thesis and antithesis, then we have the synthesis of the Holy Spirit, um, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, and some, someday I'll, I'll read more about that idea, but I just think that that's interesting how we can kind of break that triplicity into these two frameworks. One of this instinctual natural rhythm and then the other as this kind of progressive, um, you know, movement of, of experience and of the mind. I know. I mean, I kind of, I kind of balk at that a little bit because mm-hmm. like why root the feminine again, which is like, yes, very primal, but um, absolutely life sustaining and necessary uh, for everything that we see around us uh, and oppose that to um, something that's more, you know, um, more rational. And so I have questions about that, but I do think that it's interesting too, because, um, I think that Robert Graves says this, um, is that basically, you know, for so much of human history in, um, the West, we had this triple goddess kind of religion and everyone knew that that was part of what was worshiped. Um, and then at a certain point when, Um, in ancient Greece, the Indo-European invasion happened and Mm -hmm. that kind of matriarchal lunar culture was replaced by uh, the Zeus culture, the patriarchal god kind of function that was lost. Um, And so even though they're like the graces and the muses, they all got kind of pushed to the side. They were no longer the central thread um, in that religious kind of orientation. And then, you know, Graves kind of states that by like the, um, time Christianity comes around, uh, you know, people were so hungry for the Trinity Mm. that the introduction of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was like a no-brainer for people. And that's why Christianity became so very popular and so expansive. And that's just terrifying, honestly. But it speaks to (laughs) the the deep need that people have for the three. And I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, three, it really is such a huge archetypal number. I mean, just if you read fairy tales, like anything that has any kind of magical element, you know, it's going to happen in threes. Like yeah. when you were a kid and you had to say Bloody Mary into the mirror to prove that you yeah, weren't that's true. like mm-hmm. a coward. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You had to say it three times. Um, and then you always get three wishes and everything, everything comes in threes. And there is this very, very powerful archetypal kind of development of saying like, like taking the idea of the three wishes. We always like, wish for something that is stupid and basic. And then we wish for something we think is a little bit better, but it's totally wrong. And then finally, by the third wish, we actually understand what it was that we should have wished yeah. for. Right. And that's There's that this... synthesis, right? That's exactly. It. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's that natural progression of thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. And, and um, this is something I use with the tarot a lot to, in, in my um, archetypal tarot school, I bring in a little bit of, of numerology, archetypal numerology, with that three, it really is this this number that points to dynamism, to growth and expansion, and at the same time, the synthesized way through. And I think that that's a very useful way of kind of understanding that that development. I really like to bring it into the tarot. And of course, the same thing happens with the Empress card, who's number three. We have the consciousness of the magician, number one, pure consciousness. Everything's possible, total, there's no limits. And then we have the antithesis of the high priestess, who is total unconsciousness. Everything is is hidden within us. There's so many secrets that we have to tap tap into. And then we get through that, this kind of merging of these things that says, well, now there's total creativity, which connects to the magician, but also that depth 
of wisdom that connects to the high priestess. And so we have the empress who is the the fertile mother of, of everything. Um, and I, I really like, like kind of bringing in that, that idea of the dynamism, that activity and growth and fluidity and this, the motion really never stops um, when we're talking about that, that archetypal three. Yeah. I think that what comes to mind, all of that is brilliant as usual. And what comes to mind with the three is um, the idea of like the circle or the circularity, yeah. you know, um, and that being opposed to things that are a little bit more teleological and insist mm-hmm. on progress. And mm-hmm. so I think that that is something that again, is like pre-enlightenment, post-enlightenment, <laughs> lunar versus solar, right? Mm-hmm. There are like these all, there are these, again, that's another kind of dialectical pairing that we have to kind of resolve somehow. But I do think that that is part of what goes on is that the, the triplicity is about um, cycles and mm-hmm. um, honoring cycles. And when we forget that cycles are, kind of beneath everything. Uh, we forget that <clears throat> we're in rhythm with something that's really powerful ourselves as people. When we see life as a progression and yeah. like a ladder to climb or, you mm-hmm. know, just a road that we're on, I think that we miss the point of a lot of experiences that we can learn through and grow through and kind of individ- individuate through. Mm-hmm. And I think that the kind of seasonality of the triplicity, right, of like the seasons literally on earth is a reminder that we always have an opportunity to kind of re-engage with these archetypal forces again, right? So yeah. I'm not going to become a so-called maiden again, but there will be a feeling of in your next life in life. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, you know, and so life life also has its own springs and summers and winters and these moments where we're more internal or externalized and fertile versus barren or whatever you want to say. So kind of bringing in the triplicity to me is a really, really important concept because I'm personally comforted by the idea of cycles beginning and ending and giving us opportunities to like try again, right? Because when we see things as so rational and, and time moving forward rather than time being a circle, which is what it is, um, Mm -hmm. uh, we lose that, I think, connection to something deeper. Yeah. Something that came to mind is this, you sort of brought up this idea of this l- linear experience versus um, I guess we could say like a spiralitic experience, mm-hmm. which is constantly rotating around itself and from new vantage points. And something that is very interesting about that progression from three to four and four is a huge archetype as well. We talked about a little bit in our elements episode, but we could probably do a whole episode just on, on fourness, threeness and fourness. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the stabilization of dynamic energy. This is exactly what um, the the empress and the emperor show us in the tarot. Um, I think that Sally Nichols in her book, Jung and Tarot, an archetypal journey, I think that's what it's called. The, the title changed at some point. Um, but she says that if the emperor did not come in and put order to the growth of the empress, then everything would just become chaotic jungle and we'd never be able to get anywhere. And and I think that that's a really good way of understanding how that three to the four kind of works and this true dynamism of growth that's available that three often represents. And then the four representing the stabilization of it. But at the same time, something that came to, to mind as you were talking is we did have, at least the, in the Greek tradition, we had this three pointed seasonality, um, of our year. And then, but now we think of it in four. And I, I just think that this is part of that, that, uh, enlightenment thinking that move mm-hmm. towards empiricism, that we have this tendency archetypally unconsciously to try to four things off. <laughs> we try to, the circle. Yes. Right? We Isn't try to, that is? yes, mm-hmm. we try to square the circle. Um, and I, I think that, this is exactly what what Jung himself did. And it's one of these big mysteries in Jungian thought of like, what is the missing fourth? He talked about this all the time. There's a missing fourth. There's a missing fourth. And essentially what he was trying to say is that because he was a Christian, his father was a pastor. He really thought a lot in these, uh, with these religious symbols, these Christian symbols. Um, And so he thought that the Trinity was incomplete. And he, he was kind of this big question he grappled with was what is the thing that would complete that Trinity? And he kind of had different ways of talking about it. Sometimes he said that the 
that the fourth, the missing fourth was the antichrist, right? The shadow that was rejected. And then sometimes the missing fourth was the feminine also rejected. Mm -hmm. Um, So what is the thing that's been rejected from, from the whole, but there are people who critique this, this kind of push um, that, that Jung was always moving toward of saying, we need a, we need to square it off by saying, well, does it really need to be squared off? Does that, that energy of dynamism, do we always need to put the cap on it? And say, well, now it's complete. Now it's done. We've we've kind of pulled it all in. Um, and I, I think that that's part of what we do in patriarchal society. Even though we do need to find stasis, that is what that four represents. We also just always try to put things on this linear in this linear framework. Mm-hmm. In terms of time and these thesis antithesis um, synthesis moments. I think that, you know, you were talking um, so beautifully about tarot, which is your modality. And Mm -hmm. I'd like to contribute an idea from astrology that also kind of brings in this threeness, which is really interesting to me um, in astrology and the timing of the outer planet cycles. The outer planets move so slowly. And so Mm -hmm. unlike the sun and the moon, which are pretty quick, we have um, like these long periods of time where Saturn, for example, will be transiting um, a planet in your natal chart or a piece of your natal chart, your your ascendant or your midheaven. And the way that I always break it down with clients, and this is, I mean, other astrologers will do this too, is that we have three main hits of that outer planet transit, and that creates the narrative or the experience that was meant to kind of come through and become incarnate or become aware, mm. or we're supposed to become aware of it. Right. So for example, if you're in your Saturn return, it's not just a day or a month of your life. It's a whole set of, of, uh, you know, basically a year, Mm -hmm. but there are these peaks of time where transiting Saturn will approach your natal Saturn. And at the first conjunction, we have our thesis. We have the idea of what this transit is going to hold for us based on Mm -hmm. the house placement, the sign placement of your Saturn, what other aspects Saturn's making in the chart. We have the kind of like, okay, here's the thesis statement of what this transit's going to bring to you. Then soon after, Saturn will turn retrograde and he'll back himself over your natal Saturn. And that will feel intense as well, but that will be a little bit more of a kind of antithesis. We're kind of like learning through the absence of what those Saturn themes are, or we're learning through the negation. We're trying to kind of correct the thesis, but we're still not really coming up with anything that's very satisfying. And that's usually like when we're flailing in our Saturn return is that retrograde kind of hit. Yeah. And then the third hit will be the synthesis where we do kind of feel again, like maybe the world is crumbling beneath our feet, but What kind of emerges in the aftermath of that is way more clarity or way more self-actualization or just some authenticity about our Saturn return. So I love that idea. And, you know, we can kind of map that onto, um, you know, many of the planets, especially if they're having a retrograde motion. So Mercury will do the same thing Mm -hmm. usually. Um, And uh, Venus and Mars, certainly. I just had Mars retrograde in my uh, sixth house and he hit my moon three times and that was really frustrating and I did not enjoy do not recommend that uh, (laughs) experience honestly I think that's why John baby started pulling all of his hair out because the the sixth house is where we find pets and I knew that the transit of Mars through my sixth house where my moon is where like my heart center is I was like Something's going to go wrong with the kitties. And it totally freaking did. For those listeners out there who are like, what is she talking about? My (laughs) cat, John Baby, very important person. He's a very important person. He peed on me one time. He literally (laughs) peed on Marianne. It sprayed on her. Honestly, this was the beginning of the, because that was October, right? That we were in Mars. He He sprayed on me. Um, He marked me as his territory. You are his now. You should come back and see him. He's wondering where you are. Um, That was horrifying. So part of this, part of that was this transit. And he, um, he just developed such severe anxiety through Mars retrograde that he started pulling out all of his um, belly fluff and all of his hair on his hips. So that's sad. That's sad. He's okay. He's getting better now because Mars is, is getting away from my moon. (laughs) And I got a lot of like calming sprays, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of calming sprays, a lot of good brushing. Mm-hmm. 
it's kind of when you were talking about it, it made me think of alchemy because in alchemy, there's three main stages. There is the negredo, the albedo, and rubedo. Mm. Um, and then Jung actually takes a fourth stage that is less common in alchemical texts, which is the citrinitas. And he kind of puts that in between um, the the albedo and the rubedo because I'm realizing how much Jung really liked to four things off. Like he mm. really was uncomfortable with that three. That is interesting. I'm not going to psychoanalyze Jung. How dare I? Um, but someone should. Mm. Uh, <laughs> think about what that's about. Um, but anyway, so this this work of the negredo, it means blackening in, in um, Latin, right? So the idea is that it's, you put the, the material in the alembic and you destroy it and you, you know, you kind of break it down into its most base elements. This is kind of its destruction. Then the albedo is the purification of it. So you then distill it, you find, okay, well, what were these base elements? And then the rubedo is the transformation. And this is something that, um, I want to kind of turn to Edward Edinger's book. Edward Edinger is a really, um, you've mentioned him on the podcast before. He's a brilliant Jungian guy. Um, and he has a book called Ego and Archetype, which I highly recommend. Um, I should really read that. I should. Yeah, do it's really, honestly, mm-hmm. yes, it's really good. It's, you know, it's really good about Edinger. He's actually not that dry. I mean, of course, the material's a little bit dry because of what we're talking about, but He's pretty readable, I mean, for a Jungian. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm working um, my way through his book, The Eternal Drama, which is like the place yeah. of myth. Um, and it is it is very readable. So, yeah, totally. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's he's a good writer. And I have this like really old version with the gold cover that Fancy. I got from my grandpa. Um, and so it has like pictures, which makes it better. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so he says in, in this book, he has an entire chapter called The Trinity Archetype and the Dialectic of Development. So that in and of itself is just, it's a fantastic chapter. There's so much good stuff in it. And one of the things that he says is that um, the dynamic threeness kind of points to this repeating symbol of uh, death, transformation, and rebirth. Um, and so this is kind of what I think that that alchemical process is pointing to as well. The negredo being the death, the albedo being the transformation, and then the rubedo being being the rebirth. Well, it's a real like it's like the full transformation of it into its new state, right? Into the rebirth state. And so I think that this is this is a lot of what we find that three symbolizes for us is this we have, yes, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but then we also have the breakdown of something, the change of it, the the looking at it with a new perspective, the distillation of it, and then the rebirth of it, it coming mm. alive again. So that's a new or a different rather figuration of what that Trinitarian motion um, and dynamic is. Um, and I, I actually have a good quote here from this book because I think it's worth it. Read it um, to me. Yeah. So, okay. Edinger says, the threefold rhythm of the developmental process deserves greater attention. Let us consider that this ternary symbol is a separate and valid entity within itself. In this case, the archetype of the trinity or threefoldness and the archetype of quaternity or fourfoldness would refer to two different aspects of the psyche, each valid, appropriate, and complete in its own realm. The quaternity image expresses the totality of the psyche in its structural, static, or eternal sense, whereas the trinity image expresses the totality of the psychological experience in its dynamic, developmental, and temporal aspect. So I probably could have just read one sentence of that long quote, but no. <laughs> I think that it's really um, it's really good how he kind of breaks down the difference between this quaternity, which points us towards wholeness, like everything's complete, everything kind of finds its place, and the ternary symbol, that, that trinitarian image, which is dynamic, developmental, and temporal. And that kind of points back to what you were saying before about how it really does have something to do with time. There's this time theme and and image often with the with the Trinity. Yeah. And this points as well to, you know, one of the things that Ed- Edinger says in this book is that, you know, while Jung believed that the psyche needed this fourfoldness to kind of, is like a, a primary symbol of the psyche, is the four because we have like mandalas we also we have like the four corners of experience right this is very four ish um the one of the things that edinger says is that the trinity is actually a uh, maybe a better image sometimes for the psyche because we have the ego 
the I, this is who I am, maybe the maiden. <laughs> and then we have the self, right? We have the the greater experience, the thing that is, um, it's so hard to describe, but that numinous experience of self that is part of the all, maybe that's the crone. And then in between that third point, the top of the triangle is the relationship, the middle point between it, where we are fully experiencing that higher self, right? Because we can never really fully experience the capital S archetype of the self. It's like beyond us. And to only be in the ego is too limited. So we want to find the synthesis between those experiences. That's always our goal. Um, and so that's that point of the triangle, which maybe is corresponds to the mother to some extent. Um, it's a way of thinking about it that I think is interesting. Um, and that's, that's I don't know, a depth psychological way of, of kind of reengaging with that, that triplicity. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, it brings to mind for me, like, and maybe I think this is um, a Jungian derived concept, but you can totally correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I heard a long time ago, another astrologer, Stephen Forrest, say that in terms of like, you know, he was talking about um, learning how to read the astrology chart and to focus on the ascendant, the sun and the moon um, creates this really helpful triad for understanding mm -hmm. what a person's motivated by or what part of their story is. Obviously the chart is way more complex, but um, I think that the idea of persona, which is the ascendant in some formulations, uh, the sun and the moon, right? The sun being ego and then the moon being unconscious um, create this really robust picture of like what a person's got going on for them. We were just opening up the chart and that, triad does not like require a squaring it doesn't look for the the fourth necessarily i mean it looks for all the other information in the chart but mm -hmm. when we're thinking about a kind of one two three ness of encapsulating a person and creating a shorthand for what their chart is talking about that's an interesting place of entry and i think that that's really cool yeah yeah totally mm -hmm. so i i always felt like three was like, you know, this, this really important number that I, anytime I saw it, like I was in math class and I just only cared if there was a three in the number, <laughs> you know, I like got very excited about it for no reason. I wrote a story, um, called, I think like the three fairies or something. And there was a fairy of earth, a fairy of air and a fairy of water. And <laughs> No fire. <laughs> they, they, no fire. <laughs> um, uh, well, because one lived in the forest, one lived in the sea, and one lived in the sky. You can't have a fairy living in a fire, right? That's so that true. was like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> of and course. We got into adventures. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like we're all, we all, many of us at least gravitate towards this, this threeness. There's something really special and enchanting about it. It feels extremely magical. And I think you know, the, the Trinity symbol just feels like it's so personal sometimes, whereas that quaternity symbol feels like it's, it's more cosmic. It's more like ordered universe, whereas the Trinity feels like internal universe. Of, of I would movement. even say like the quaternity feels to me like bureaucracy or like, mm -hmm. like answers, like between the mm. emperor and the empress, I'm going to go sit with the empress instead of the emperor personally. I feel like I wouldn't know what to say to her, so I probably would go sit with the emperor because I know what we'd talk about. I would just say, hi, be my mom. I would, I'd that would be very sweet. I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't even know. Do I, do I lay prostrate in front of you? I don't know what to do. <laughs> this is, this is my own weird psychology around mother goddesses. I don't know what to do with them, but that I know what to do with the emperor. You're going to go and you're going to, you're going to talk about Hegel. That's what yeah. you're going to do. And See? he'll be like, cool. You're a cool dude. Um, <laughs> that's. Anyway, let's get out of my brain. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that um, as a way of maybe like winding us down or around the triplicity um, idea, I think that I kind of feel, you know, compelled to think about the three fates just for a moment. Yeah, let's because do it. Because um, they are so weird and they're so they are. important. And this idea of like the, okay, so in Greek myth, um, there are these three fates called the Moirai. And um, there's one of them, they all are kind of like uh, arranged around this spinning wheel, um, like mm -hmm. for a spinning thread, which is such an archetypal 
you know, tool or piece of technology that comes up in fairy tales all the time. And yeah. to me, the circle of the wheel is about time itself. And yeah. that's like a whole other conversation. But, you know, anyway, so with with the three fates, there is one fate who sits at the wheel. Her name is Clotho. And she is the one that spins the thread onto the spindle. And she's the one that's able to kind of like create. We're creating this filament of life. Um, there is the third second fate and her name is Lachesis um, and she is like the measurer of thread and so she determines how long a person's life is and she measures with this very like you know official rod that she's using to determine how long your life will be and then the third fate is Atropos who is the cutter of the thread and so she determines how everybody dies and That to me is just number one, so potent and spooky. Mm -hmm. And number two, just such an interesting uh, manifestation of the cycle of, you know, death and rebirth through this idea of the thread, which is to me like such a potent symbol for so many other things. And maybe we'll do an episode on the labyrinth and we can talk about the threads more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, you know, to me, there's like comfort in the the mother maiden crone um, triplicity thing. It's like way more friendly. The triplicity of the fates, the Moirai, is like very forbidding. And I think that that yeah. kind of speaks to, I don't know, part of the crone aspect of the triplicity in general or of the kind of severity of like life and death as a symbol that's inherent in that triplicity. And it doesn't have, yeah. like it's missing, it is missing that fourth. It's like, and then what, right? Then what happens with the thread, with the soul? Um, and I think that the severity of that is really, really interesting for our imaginations. Like, um, And so, you know, with the three seasons, the three graces, the three, um, you know, ways of like, you know, seeing the seasons, there's, you know, the muses, everything is very beautiful and kind of romantic, but then there's this like kind of underworld triplicity that feels really interesting. Actually, doesn't Cerberus the dog that guards have three the heads. of hell mm-hmm. has three heads. Yeah. So that, again, it's just like everywhere we look, the three comes up. And I do think that it's always symbolizing that sort of like, you know, sunrise, midday, sunset, mother, maiden, crone, crescent, moon, full moon, waning crescent thing. And it is everywhere. And so, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really good segue to talk about our, uh, our symbol because it is, you ended us on a spooky note. <laughs> And here we go <laughs> into the spookiest stuff. So cool. um, I, I think that this conversation has been so delightful. So let's uh, let's maybe explore some symbols now. If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to learn more about how you can support us on Patreon. There's many benefits available, including extended episodes, guided tarot meditations, and astrology transit journals. But all listeners are welcome to share a symbolic experience for us to explore on the show. Therefore, we invite listeners to pull those symbols from their lives, whether they come from a dream or synchronicity. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience on our website, sorormysticapodcast.com. Jungian Online presents Jung Academy, a personal growth learning platform for you. Join expert faculty, analysts, authors, and artists for live and video classes and events in the continuing tradition of Jungian psychology. Join us live or watch later. Our courses are accessible and presented in a way that everyone can follow and enjoy. Come together in search of meaning. Come explore jungacademy.com. And as a recent addition to the faculty, I can't encourage you highly enough to go check out youngacademy.com. Kaluna Alchemy creates natural self-care ritual products and guidebooks that help you cultivate a connection between mind, body, and spirit. With offerings that nurture authentic self-expression, Kaluna Alchemy's ritual tools always meet you exactly where you need to be met. Their website is beautiful and offers an opportunity to sign on for a monthly box of ritual tools delivered to you. You can find more about Kaluna Alchemy at their website, kalunaalchemy.com, or on Instagram, where their handle is kaluna.alchemy. Okay, so before we jump into our our symbol, um, we're actually going to, I just want to quickly mention um, a listener 
told us about a synchronicity that happened after listening to our last episode about roses. And I thought it was just like a sweet way to kind of show how these things can layer into our lives and and how they can can, uh, kind of manifest. So this listener says that they were listening to the Rose episode of Sora Mystica as they drove to work. And I was thinking about my desire to embrace a more symbolically rich life. And the episode made me think of a favorite book series of mine, Stephen King's Dark Tower. The Rose is the anima mundi there, the world soul. I've never read that, but now I want to. Um, I was driving decently fast in the fast lane, but a van was tailgating me the whole time. It was persistent, and I finally found a chance to let them pass. On the back of the van, rose plumbing with a giant illustration of a rose. Not the first association most people have with plumbing, but I appreciate you saying, hi, universe. The rose now feels like an active symbol in my life, and I'm keeping an eye out. Um, So I think that that's so delightful because that's exactly how it starts to show up, right? You just Mm. listen to it, something pops in. The, The symbol starts to take on meaning. And then it appears around you. And yes, some some skeptics out there will be like, well, you're noticing it now because you're thinking of it. And honestly, what does it matter? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the symbol is appearing and it's appearing. I'm sure it will come at least two or three more times um, for you, dear listener. So just noticing these symbols, knowing what they mean, exploring them and kind of holding that in. I think it's very interesting that the rose, which we talked so much about it being beautiful, and mystical, and then it's on a plumbing Rose truck. Plumbing. It's yeah, awesome. yeah, it is. There's something interesting there about marrying the mundane and the and the divine, and marrying the beautiful and the the base and all of that stuff. So anyway, something for you to ponder and think about. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I think that's really useful to reflect on. That's great. I feel like I saw a lot of comments actually on Instagram of people being like. Roses are everywhere right now. I can't yeah. believe, you know. So I think that roses are obviously a very popular flower, but yes. it seemed like that was a really activated symbol. So mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, I feel like that's a good goal for this show is to just like it's to just make things make magic mm-hmm. happen. Yes, exactly. We will make mm-hmm. magic happen. Um, all right, so on to our main uh, symbol for today. So this one is a little bit on the spooky side, and I chose this one. Um, Christina's not the biggest fan of the spooky side of, of things. I like ghosts. I don't like violence. You with your true crime. <laughs> violence. Okay. True crimes I can't do. <laughs> but like you don't but you don't like scary movies either, you said. Um, I'll watch like a psychological thriller. Like I love David Lynch, you know. Okay. Like, well well, my... David Lynch is just like art. Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me is scary. <laughs> it's, it's really so scary. scary. It is very scary, but it's also like it's also like art. Your brain is like a like wow. Maybe how that's why this... I can handle it. Mm-hmm. It's it's yeah. very artistic. Like I don't have you do you, like do you watch The Ring or like no. things like that? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not you. <laughs> Do you know what I don't? I can't watch violence because I'm too I'm too sensitive, but I like legitimately believe in ghosts. So like, yeah, well, you see ghosts, so you have to believe in them. It doesn't it doesn't freak me out as much. So I'm like open to that. But anyway, so well, continue. That I don't. I'm not a I'm not a big ghosty person. No, thank you. Um, but uh, I do I do like to be a little scared sometimes. Do you did I ever tell you the story of how I watched The Exorcist for the first time? Now we're going into a tangent, but now we have to talk about it. <laughs> no. no. Oh my I god, so. this is this is telling you something about my psychology. So um, when I was 12, 13, 12, 13, I had my big Catholic, you know, awakening. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had this moment. No one told me to do this. I decided all on my own. I, I was already Catholic, but I was like, I'm going to be a really good Catholic. I'm going to be the most devout Catholic there ever was. And I, I really did. I really believed in it. And so I was like, but you know what? If I'm going to really believe in this, I have to confront the dark side of it. And The Exorcist um, was a very intense movie that I knew was like a thing like everyone should watch in their lifetime. How did I know that at 12? I don't know. Um, so we went to Blockbuster (laughs) and they had it and I was like, mom, I want to watch this. And she was like, absolutely not. Um, because she was like, had this thing with scary movies. It's like, oh, you can only watch it if I'm there. Like, and I can like judge if it's like too bad, like then I'm going to turn off. Um, and I was like, I could do it. I am 12. And she's like, no, you can't. I was like, I can't, I can't. (laughs) So she, she let me do it. She's like, I'm not watching this one because I've seen it. It's horrible. I'm not watching it. She's like, okay. And so what did I do? I decided that I was going to put it on at midnight by myself. Um, my house was full of ghosts and and scary things and it scared me all the time. 
So I don't know why I decided to do that. So I was all alone in the night and watching it. And I got so scared that I got the crucifix off the wall (laughs) (laughs) and held it over my heart for the whole length of the movie. (laughs) Wow. What a drama queen. See? It's scary. It's it was scary. So scared. I did it. I did it though. It's so I watched funny. it all by myself. So anyway, now we're going to talk about someone's dream that's not about the exorcist. So I'm going to read it. So after listening to your debut podcast episode, which was incredible, thank you very much. I am inspired to share my reoccurring dream of the haunted house. The house in my dream varies in size, shape, and form, but the theme does not. I show up at this house, whether it's my home or not, and the room that I am meant to sleep in is haunted AF. (laughs) The catch is no one else at the residence knows that but me and the ghost. I am somehow deathly afraid yet disturbingly determined to face this ghost slash haunting slash demon entity occupying my space only. It becomes nightfall, aka bedtime, and I must confront the haunting energy by being in the room. I encourage it to show itself to come out, so to speak, but it won't. No matter how much I beg with screams for it to reveal itself, it won't make itself seen, only felt. I am often left feeling defeated and drained. Over the years, this dream has become more intense and frightening as it peaks. Mm-hmm. And they mentioned just that they they had a, a, a scary, you know, pretty traumatic episode as a kid of seeing a, a ghost. Um, and so just... Obviously, there's there's probably some some layers of ghost fear in there because of that. Um, mm-hmm. But this was a spooky one, and the reason I chose it for today is because last night I dreamed of a haunted house, and I don't think I've ever had that symbol come up for me before. So it's something that is just like in my mind. So I thought it would be good to explore today. What is the symbol of the haunted house? Mm, synchronicity. I love that yeah. so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is that the house. What it generally symbolizes in, in like, you know, like Jungian dream theory is that it, it symbolizes the structure of the psyche, right? Like when we're in the house, we move from space to space. We move from like, like, uh, you know, experiences of, of, our, of our own psyche, of our own development. Um, and so when we have a haunted house, we're kind of in like the shadow version of the house. Like we're, we're in like not our own domain to some extent, like our own conscious domain, but like the domain of the shadow. Um, and in this dream... It sounds like it's it's not the house that's haunted itself, um, but that your space in particular uh, is is haunted by. It sounds like a single entity, a ghost or a demon or something that is is scary and won't show itself to you. And I think, like in a very basic way, that points to just the shadow experience of some shadow figure, some shadow truth within you that just won't be revealed. It like won't come out. It won't rise up into consciousness, even though it's somehow letting itself be known to you. And that is, that is spooky. That is really spooky. I'm spooking myself as I'm talking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that that's really interesting. And when I think of a haunted house, I think like the house to me um, equates a lot of time to like um, obviously domestic experiences and family ghosts or family trauma. And so I think that, you know, there is something in the haunted house that's almost like you're saying, kind of a ghost in the, in the psyche or the shadow psyche. And I think that the fear of confronting what is dark is a very natural fear. But I also do think that there's legitimately stuff in life that scares us and that like, you know, so it's not to say, oh, you're just like fearing shadow to fear the haunted Mm -hmm, house. No, mm -hmm. there's something legitimately, um, you know, provocative and destabilizing and maybe even unsafe about this particular spirit. And so I think that, you know, obviously I don't have a remedy for that, but I do think that knowing that it's something that maybe is seeking integration in some way or also like seeking banishment, seeking that kind of exorcism. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I I don't think it's seeking integration. It's not Mm -hmm. showing itself. I mean, I I think you make a really good point because this is something that that like Jungians say a lot. Not everything is there to be integrated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like not everything is ready to be. I like sometimes when I pull cards for, I pull the devil inverted for people and they're like, well, how do I work with that? depending on like where it is in the reading and what's going on with them. Sometimes I'm like, don't, Yeah, we don't, we don't let the devil in sometimes. (laughs) 
you know, like this is sometimes we have to, we have to strengthen ourselves first. We have to feel like we're in a state where we can really face something, especially devils. I like, I'm scared of devils. Mm. <laughs> I have, maybe it's because I watched the exorcist as a child. I was thinking about it. <laughs> you know, one time in my, in my class, in our, in like one of our sessions, we're, we're just chatting about stuff and we started chatting about the devil card and like a lot of people had a really like so, such great interpretations, you know, talking about how it connects to like, you know, our sexual experience and sense of freedom and all these things. But the more we talked about it, the more scared I got until I had to be like, I think that we need to move on from this conversation. And like everyone in the, in the, even though we we're in Zoom, like everyone kind of felt this like shift. There was like the archetype kind of was like getting constellated a little bit. And I think yeah. everybody was getting a little bit spooked out by talking about it so much. So I think that when we dream of those really scary things that are literally like these ephemeral, just, you know, uh, violent, potentially aggressive entities, I think it's okay that it doesn't need to be present or it doesn't necessarily need to show itself right now. I would certainly say because the dream keeps repeating this way and you keep asking it to show itself and it keeps not showing itself. Whatever that relationship is between you and that thing, maybe it is a piece of your shadow. Maybe it is a you know um, a uh, inherited trauma, you know, fr- of familial trauma. That could certainly be it too. Like it, it, the dynamic between you hasn't changed. The dream keeps repeating itself to point out that this this has not changed. I remember, you know, at, when I was in analysis, I kept having this very particular dream. Um, where I would like try to tell someone something, someone I was angry at and just try to tell them over and over again. I just dreamt this like endlessly and they would always not hear me. They just couldn't hear me. And then finally, like as I, after like two years of this and I was doing such deep inner work, like I told them and they said, I'm sorry. And I remember in the dream being like, what? This is not how this goes. Mm -hmm. Like I was shocked by that because it finally did change. And it sounds like something does kind of need to change because of how much it's repeating. It might not be that you see the ghost though. It might be that you change how you're relating to it instead of mm-hmm. demanding it show itself. Go into a and, different room or leave yeah. the house or something like that. Yeah, leave mm-hmm. leave the house, say I don't want to see you, take the power back by saying I I won't look for you. I'm not I'm not interested in seeing you right now. But it does sound like like there this uh whatever this entity is has the power in the dynamic that and that kind of is maybe what needs to shift. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I learned that from you that when you have repeating dreams and it doesn't change, it's because your orientation to whatever in your imagination or your psyche is prompting this dream is not changing. And so, you know, I think that that's a really helpful thing to remember. And this is also one of those instances where maybe lucid dreaming becomes um, an exploratory tool. Yeah. You like active imagination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you kind of like bring the image into the imagination Carefully, because it sounds like this one scares you a little bit. So like, Mm -hmm. make sure one of the things that you can do when you're going to do some active imagination, which is basically just that you you bring the dream image in and you allow it to continue without directing it, you know, by your ego mind, um, is to like tell someone you're going to do that and ask Mm -hmm. them to text you or to call you in like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, Because sometimes we kind of get lost in it and then we need to be like kind of shocked out out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so something like that, especially when you're dealing with scarier images can be can be helpful but I would say that might be a good thing to try out is to bring it into that lucid conscious mm-hmm. space and see can I can I maybe shift how this dynamic goes in this dream yeah um, yeah and if and if the ghost shows itself to you I want to know who it is <laughs> yeah we want to know we want to know we want to know who's causing trouble so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all right well thank you for sharing that um that spooky dream i'm officially spooked i'm gonna be spooked for a while <laughs> i'm gonna go watch something else on tv that's happy um and this has been fun it's been a, a kind of a meandering wild exciting episode and uh thanks for being here thank you everyone it's so nice to be here with you and we will see you next time Thank you for joining us in our conversation today. Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following Soar or Mystica wherever you listen. You can also become a more active supporter and 
a member of the Soror Mystica community by joining our Patreon. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at sorormysticapodcast.com. The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.